Hello, it is a great honor to be speaking at the beginning of this year's conference of the Foundation for Endangered Languages. I would like to first thank the conference organizers, particularly Professor Edda Doremi, for inviting me to participate in this important event. I uh, accepted Edda's gracious invitation for two reasons. The first reason is professional. I would uh, very much like to learn from colleagues from around the world about the state and study of Abaresh. And the second reason is rather personal. Albania and particularly Tirana holds a very special place in my childhood memory. You see, I was born and grew up in China in the 1960s. Well, now you can figure out how old I am. When Albania was one of China's very few Western allies. So in my case, I had heard of the city of Tirana when I was a child long before I heard of places such as New York and Paris and London. Well, thanks to digital technology, today at least I get to be in Tirana virtually. So once again, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. The title of my talk today is Living and Languaging Across Territory and Time Toward a Dynamic View of Linguistic Diaspora. So we will begin by considering how the uh, concept of diaspora has evolved over time. And then we will be looking at the various dimensions and contexts of diaspora languages, particularly with reference to the social cultural identities of the speakers of these languages. And then we would move on to consider how language, languaging, and the diaspora experiences are mutually constitutive. And I'll be using Chinese in the US as an illustrative example. And in the end, we will together consider some implications for research and practice. So this is the outline. Let us begin. So what is diaspora? Um, we all know that the word comes from Greek and it originally refers to an ethnic or religious group that originated from some place but then dispersed to different locations. So this concept has been used to refer to the Greeks in the Hellenic world and then obviously to the Jewish experience, particularly the expulsion of the Jewish people from their homeland. Beginning in the 1950s and 60s, scholars have also begun to use the term to describe the African experience. And the use of the term has been extended further since then to apply to many other groups as well, such as Armenians and Kurds and Tamils and so forth. So given the history of the usage, the term then has often carried with it a sense of loss, a sense of banishment and exile uh, and a sense of collective trauma, a connotation of difficulties and disadvantages and this everlasting longing to return to the homeland, as is the case with the Jews, the Africans and the many others. Today, the connotation of the term has undergone considerable change. It could even suggest a positive and ongoing relationship between the migrants' homelands and their places of settlement. So when we talk about diaspora today, we, yes, we still think of the dispersal from the original homeland. We still think of the collective memory and perhaps even the myth about the homeland. We still think about borders and boundaries, but the term has now, um, been associated with the notion of mobility, migration, and transnationalism in the context of geographic movement. And, and I think the word that is used very commonly these days is the word flow, you know, in the context of a flow of many resources, both human and non-human, both physical and figurative. And today, we know that not all diasporas result from expulsion, expansion, commerce um, that is associated with colonization, war, trade, right? Um, 
obviously there's a clear distinction between those who have the economic and cultural, including linguistic resources to travel across borders as they please and who are welcomed and respected wherever they go. And those who are less privileged and who must struggle to be accepted and whose geographic mobility does not necessarily lead to upward social mobility. So this distinction is going to have very important implications for research on diaspora languages, which we will consider uh, next. So diaspora languages are languages spoken by diaspora speakers who have dispersed for various reasons from their places of cultural origin. So when the term diaspora language was first coined in 1980s, there was an element of ambiguity, uh, at, at least at the surface level of its meaning. It could refer to the languages that the diasporas take with them from their places of origin as they move elsewhere. It could also refer to languages that diasporas use, um, including both the languages they take from their places of origin, as well as new languages that they have acquired in the context of history of diaspora. In other words, it could refer to the entire linguistic repertoire of diasporas. So whichever the case, the emergence and the maintenance, in some cases, it is attrition, you know, the loss, and or the shift of diaspora languages is inevitably and critically interwoven with the retention sometimes it's the rejection uh, and or transformation of the cultural identities of the diasporas. So, you know, today we have great ease of transportation and communication, right? And with that, many diasporas maintain very close ties uh, with their places of origin financial ties, familial ties, cultural ties, and yes, indeed, linguistic ties, right? These ties also exist between the very scattered groups among themselves in diaspora. Uh, so nowadays, information is constantly and instantaneously transmitted and circulated across various spaces and different time zones in languages and dialects in the linguistic repertoire that is shared by those who have moved elsewhere, the diaspora, and those who have stayed behind, the domestic. So diaspora languages then include features, both from the languages that the diasporas carry with them from their places of origin and from the languages of their places of settlement. So when today's diasporas articulate their cultural identities and affinities, they're not merely talking about some shared geographical places of origin. They're also talking about some measure of shared social, cultural, and linguistic experience as well. So in the words of David Gramlin, uh, an applied linguist, History and home reside in the languages, which he calls lingua scene, rather than in the physical location. And the languages must be recreated to express and explore their particular cultural experiences. So for example, you know, immigrants to the United States try to mold both their immigrant languages and English into languages which can become home in diaspora. And to discursively construct a hyphenated American identity, something like African American or Chinese American, to bring continuity and coherence to their cultural and linguistic selves and communities. So the diaspora languages are not merely used for purposes of nostalgia, of maintaining values and the practices of the past or of somewhere else, but also for the purposes of constructing the here and the now, and for shaping a re-envisioned future. 
across generations and geographies. So then our question is this, you know, what is happening in research to address the role that language plays in constructing and negotiating diaspora identities and relations? Well, research in this area is often premised upon relationships between a fixed geographical homeland, a population move from that place to somewhere else, and the cultural and linguistic practices associated with that population and their context experience. So for a very long time, the notion diaspora has been built upon the notion of homeland, exile, and return, as we mentioned before. So the diasporic phenomena have been conceptualized by and large as something that is static and territorialized. More recently, researchers have approached language and the diasporic process by focusing on migrant populations from a given origin who bring about cultural and linguistic transformation to their new place of settlement. I think this is most evident in the recent work on super diversity, right, where we're talking about diverse modes of linguistic practices associated with specific migrant patterns and specific settlements. So current research highlights the dynamic and ideological nature of diasporic phenomena. So for example, what is a diaspora language? What is a domestic language? What is a foreign language? I mean, these questions have everything to do with racial linguistic ideologies, as have been pointed out by Flores and Rosa. So to illustrate this point, let me use the ethnic Chinese in the US as an example. Ethnic Chinese came to the United States in three big uh, waves. The first wave took place in the 19th century when Chinese immigrants worked as laborers, particularly on the American transcontinental railroads. They were used as cheap labor, which caused many white people losing their jobs and becoming angered by the yellow peril in the land that is considered for whites only. As a result, in 1882, the United States Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, prohibiting immigration from China. The second wave took place in, uh, during the period between 1945 and 1980. This is when the Chinese, uh, the US and the China became allies during World War II, and the situation for Chinese Americans began to improve. In 1943, the Chinese immigration to the United States was once again permitted, and large scale of Chinese immigration started in 1965 when the US Immigration and Natural and Immigration and the Nationality Act of 1965 lifted national origin quotas. So during the late 1960s and early and mid 1970s, ethnic Chinese immigration into the United States came almost exclusively from Hong Kong and Taiwan. The third wave um, started in the 1980s and continuing into the present, <clears throat> excuse me, when the People's Republic of China removed the restrictions on immigration and that led to immigration of college students and professionals who have come to the US with educational privilege and some with financial resources as well. So, and in addition to students and professionals, we have also seen recent immigrants, uh, including uh, those who are undocumented, who have come to the US in search of lower status manual uh, jobs. So put together the ethnic Chinese uh, American community is the largest overseas Chinese community outside of Asia. The uh, nine, uh, 2016 um, 
Community Survey of U.S. Census estimated a population of Chinese Americans of one or more races to be over 5 million. So the members of the Chinese American community may have very uh, different sociocultural experiences depending on which wave they or their parents and grandparents came to the US, whether their places of origin are located within mainland China, or is it in from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, etc. Whether or not they have come with privilege and resource, and whether or not they have good command of English, and what specific dialects of Chinese they bring with them, um, and whether or not they are of mixed race and how much they know or even care about traditional Chinese culture, right? So there's a great uh, diversity there. Given such big dichronic and synchronic diversity and complexity, this construction, this discursive construction of people and places and language and the life naturally also varies greatly. So at this point, I would invite you uh, to join me as we consider two specific cases. The first uh, uh, individual case, uh, I, I would give a name, Cindy. So Cindy is a Chinese American who came to the US during the third wave in the uh, late 1990s as a college graduate. She now works in New York City as a financial analyst She's married to an Italian American and has two children. This is how she refers to people in her life when she talks about them in the third person. Okay? She would refer to her children as they Americans. She would say, well, you know, these kids are hopeless. They Americans, they don't understand our Chinese ways. Uh, when she refers to her husband, uh, she calls him Lao Wai. Uh, literal translation into English is the, that old foreigner. That is a term that is used by Chinese to refer to non-Chinese persons. And even though her husband's family immigrated to the US two generations before she did, she calls her Chinese American friends of mainland background, we Chinese, and her Chinese American friends of Taiwanese background, they Taiwanese, and her Chinese business counterparts in Beijing, they Chinese, and she refers to all European Americans in general as Americans, African Americans, she calls them Blacks, and Latinx Americans, she calls them the Spanish speaking people. When she describes herself, she uses a variety of labels as well. Uh, sometimes she refers to herself as Chinese in a social gathering. Sometimes she refers to herself as half Italian because she's married to an Italian. Um, when uh, uh, she's speaking in the context of comparing American versus Chinese social media, for example, she would refer to herself as American. When she's in a discussion about anti-Asian racism in the US and xenophobia, she would refer to herself as Asian American or Chinese American. Okay. So there are different ways of presenting herself depending on the speech situation, the rhetorical goal, and the various kinds of interlocutors that she's with. She speaks, uh, Cindy speaks primarily English at work. She mixes English and Mandarin. Chinese when she's communicating with colleagues who understand Mandarin Chinese. She uses English with her husband, tries to speak Mandarin Chinese with her children, watches Italian and Korean movies with English subtitles. She video chats with her parents who live in China in a, in a, in a city in the south called Wenzhou. Uh, she chats with her parents at least once a week speaking the local dialect, the Wenzhou dialect. She follows news in English, follows pop music and entertainment from China in Chinese language through the internet, 
She connects with friends in English on Facebook and in Chinese on WeChat, which is a mainland China social media. She constantly translates for her husband and her children things Chinese into English and for her children things American into Chinese and particularly Mandarin. And she translates for her parents things American into Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, as well as the Wenzhou dialect. Um, Cindy at the same time is also beginning to forget how to handwrite Chinese characters, right? Chinese language, the logographic writing. She tries very hard to keep up with new expressions in Chinese through this Chinese social media WeChat. And she finds it much easier to talk about work in English. She has long given up hope on teaching her children Wenzhou dialect, even though she has kept in touch with a group of friends uh, from the same hometown. The Mandarin Chinese that she speaks is almost uh, always interlaced with English expressions. So translanguaging has become the norm for her. Cindy teaches her children Chinese. She sends them to weekend Chinese language schools, but her children did not appreciate it, right? Uh, they consider learning Chinese a great burden. The Chinese language school is community-based, largely run by uh, local parent volunteers. There's no public funding for schools like this, and there's no articulation between the curriculum of the language school with the regular school system, which we call K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade. So Cindy, on one hand, tries to speak as much Chinese as possible to her children at home, but at the same time, in public spaces, she wants her children to speak English only. She's acutely aware that no matter how accomplished or how educated she is, uh, ethnic Chinese are vulnerable to verbal assaults or even physical attacks during crisis, for example, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Even though she herself did, uh, said that she has never felt uh, being discriminated against personally. She, yes, she is a proud of, uh, she proud of the a Chinese cultural heritage and she wants her children to be proud of that heritage as well. But at the same time, she prefers that her children hide their chi Chinese background in public space for safety reasons. Right, so she has recently started to learn about Chinese American history, the history of racism in the US. And she admits that uh, prior to, uh, until recently, she has been very ignorant about that part of American history. She said that she would one day want to write down her experiences so that her children will not be seen uh, as ignorant as she is about Chinese and Chinese American histories. Uh, and she really does not have a lot of hope that her children would ever become fully functional uh, in the Chinese language. Even though Cindy has no plan at all to return to China, uh, every trip she makes to China, and she makes many trips for both business and for personal reasons to visit her parents, right? Every trip she makes to China, she calls it Hui Guo, returning to home country. Uh, at the end of the trip, when she's about to return to the US, she would say Hui Mei Guo, returning to America. So for her, return is, goes both directions. Whichever direction she goes, she travels. It is for her a return. When she refers to things Chinese, she uses na, there, or uh, guo nei, domestic. When she refers to things uh, American, uh, US, in the US, she says zhe, here, or zai mei guo, in America. Visiting parents in the hometown 
uh, she says, this is Huijia Kanfumu, returning home to visit parents. Returning to New York, New York City is Huijia, returning home. Visiting her in-laws in Brooklyn, which is a borough in New, of New York City, uh, she uh, characterized that as Chu Tamenjia, going to their home. So one day I asked her, where is home? Where is your home? And she says, my family is in New York City. My parents live in China. And I see my parents every weekend on WeChat. So home is where family is, and it could be in multiple geographical locations, and it could also exist virtually online. So as we mentioned earlier, it is the concept of homeland from which diaspora occurs. However, in the case of Cindy, returning to her place of origin is clearly not her goal and not even her desire or imagination. To people like Cindy, diaspora no longer has a static or stable identity tied to the homeland or to the past. You know, Cindy stays current with people and events in the homeland. She can both claim and codify her present experiences without nostalgia for the homeland or much sense of victimhood in the communities in which she and her family live, work, study. So through Cindy, we get a glimpse of the multilingual repertoire of contemporary Chinese diasporic persons. Their patterns of translation, translation of both language and culture, their ways of constructing both personal and collective identities in various kinds of speech communities to which they have simultaneous access, and we can also see the efforts to learn Chinese American history through visuals and text and the desire to construct memory and a right history for future generations. So we, we often say that you know, language and ideology, language ideology refers to our mental models that connect specific types of linguistic choices and forms with specific groups of people who stereotypically use them, right? So we have, we are, we are used to focusing on the symbiotic existence and production of linguistic and social categories, you know, as in the case of one language, one language, one people, one place, that kind of assumption. But when you, when you take a look at people like Cindy, we would have to do some rethinkings about whether such one-on-one -on -one mapping is appropriate and adequate. Now let's take a look at our second case, which I would call Christine. Christine is a young college graduate trying to make a living in New York City. She's a third generation Chinese American from the San Francisco area. Her extended family includes persons of many races, Asian, Caucasian, Black, and Hispanic. Her grandparents came to the US from Shanghai via Hong Kong in the 1940s, soon after World War II. So her grandparents uh, immigrated to the US during the second wave. When um, at the time, Hong Kong was a British colony. Hong Kong was only returned to China in 1997. So Christine grew up listening to her grandparents and parents speak Cantonese, not Mandarin. Cantonese, uh, a major dialect uh, of Chinese. And she has some receptive knowledge of Cantonese, but she can barely speak it herself. Her Chinese literacy is almost non-existent. Uh, she still has, uh, she keeps her Chinese name, which she uses as her middle name, and her literacy is not, is nothing much beyond uh, the capacity to write the characters for her Chinese name. She has traveled with her family to sh uh, both Shanghai and Hong Kong, uh, and she has found that um, the many Chinese traditions that her grandparents uh, have been keeping are 
not practiced or are no longer practiced in mainland China. Uh, and, and not to mention the fact that it is Mandarin and not Cantonese that is used as the standard dialect in most part of China. And even Hong Kong uh, these days is very different from her grandparents' memory and their description right? uh, in terms of the demographics and the varieties of Chinese dialects that are being used there today. Another thing is that her grandparents have always taken great pride in traditional uh, Chinese uh, values, you know, such as politeness, modesty, industri industriousness, deference, and dignity. And the grandparents have always thought that these are um, uh, these are Chinese values. These Chinese values are morally superior to. Uh, American values, even though America enjoys material superiority, it is the traditional Chinese culture that has this moral superiorities. But Cindy, uh, Christine, uh, however, uh, finds that these kinds of superiorities are not easy to identify in the places that she visited and the people that she met. So when in China, Christine is considered as an outsider. Uh, she's considered a banana, that is someone with yellow skin, but is white inside. So she wishes that she had some, the, the means and the opportunity to learn some form of Chinese. If not Mandarin, Cantonese would have been nice too. Uh, on the other hand, even though that American English is the only language Christine is fully competent in, and San Francisco is the only place she considers home. She often receives compliments such as, wow, your English is so good. Wow, you sound like a native speaker. So when she explains that she's actually from San Francisco, people would invariably ask, where are you really from. During COVID-19, she was verbally assaulted by a stranger while taking the subway and was told to get out and go home. So newer immigrants from China uh, would view someone like, like Christine as American. The non-Chinese Americans would see her as Chinese and she insists that she is American because in her own words, I speak English and nothing else. Or Hong Kong American, if pressed, if, you know, if she's pressed for a more specific identification. So Christine's case is rather different from Cindy. Christine does have language and cultural barriers. She does not and is not able to move easily between the place of her family's settlement and the place of their origin, uh, neither physically or figuratively, right? But in a in a, some ways, she's also similar to Cindy because uh, the uh, Christine and her family, and including her grandparents, also have no desire or plan to return to the place of their family's origin, in spite of racism and xenophobia in the United States. So to Christine, places like Shanghai, Hong Kong, or China in general, belongs to the memories and perhaps imaginations of her grandparents and is rather remote and removed from her own everyday life. So now, what can we learn from these two cases? Uh, the literature on diaspora tends to assume the existence of the origin of state, the homeland, in a singular form, right? So, however, there are instances where this is not the case, right? Where the assumed cultural homeland could disintegrate into two or more parts, linguistically, politically, and historically, right? As in the case of mainland China and Hong Kong. So the two cases that we have considered, uh, Cindy and Christine, provides us with an excellent lens to study the phenomenon of bifurcated homelands 
and the theoretical implications for our understanding of this language and the diaspora relationship. While language is often viewed as a proxy for cultural and identity formation and transformation, there are many other factors that come into play when it comes to diaspora identities. These factors could include geographical, sociological, technological, political, ecological systems, right? So whether we experience social and linguistic injustice, whether we experience discrimination, whether th th our speech is racialized and whether the diaspora speech communities are minoritized, etc. And equally importantly, diaspora is an, a social and a linguistic construction. So Christine, for reasons of race and less privileged socioeconomic status, is, is domestic but perpetually cast as a displaced and a diasporic person. And during times of crisis, she is unwelcome and unwanted. Even though she's a third generation immigrant, she maintains very few linguistic ties with the place of her family's origin, and she does not have the desire or the resources, neither financial resources or cultural linguistic resources, to move or return to the place of the family's origin, right? And even her English, which is just about as native as it gets, draws attention. Uh, her English is racialized uh, in the disguise of compliments. Cindy, on the other hand, for reasons of privileged socioeconomic status, enjoys her diasporic status. She has a good command of a range of linguistic or cultural resources, as well as this uh, 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 fluid uh, mobility to cross borders as she pleases. So she can draw on her rich diasporic linguistic repertoire to present and project different dimensions of her cultures and, uh, and her identities. Okay. So the point is that neither Christine's nor Cindy's ways of knowing and reading and interpreting the world of diaspora uh, communities due to different diasporic experiences should be consigned to the fringes of mainstream conversations regarding the past and the present understandings of diasporic languages, communities, and humanities in general. So now, what does all this mean for research and practice? Uh, we now move to implications. Uh, as mentioned previously, the use and the significance of diaspora languages need to be examined in the context of their rich diaspora space. So in my view, diaspora languages must be positioned and contextualized within the entire linguistic repertoire of their speakers. So rather than focusing exclusively on discrete languages, we should be looking at the entire linguistic repertoires. Secondly, I think we need a dynamic and evolving view of diaspora, which will enable us to understand not only the identity connections diaspora communities maintain uh, with the home and the host, but also understand their development over time. So for example, uh, the initial economic migrants over time could become diaspora and maybe one day domestic. Also, for example, um, younger generations may at some point no longer be interested in their parents or grandparents' memories or identities and so forth. Thirdly, I think our discussion of diaspora languages should be grounded in the critical consideration of social justice. Uh, critical engagement, for example, community service learning uh, would play a crucial role in developing diaspora language learners' identities 
and connections to the diaspora language community, language attitudes, and the sociocultural and sociolinguistic awareness. Uh, and finally, as societies become increasingly multicultural and linguistically diverse, we need to consider um, some very important questions. For example, what steps do we need to take to enhance all speakers' multilingualism, not just within the diasporic communities, but also the domestic as well, right? How can a multilingual approach to communication and education improve everybody's language awareness, language skills, and intercultural communicative competence? Right? And how can multilingualism empower di diaspora language speakers' identities and increase their confidence and motivation to learn and maintain diaspora languages? So, to, uh, I guess, wrap things up, I have presented a largely constructivist perspective. And within this per perspective, linguistic diaspora is viewed as multilingual and intercultural communicative practices across generations and geographies. And in this view, diasporas are, are dynamic and evolving rather than static or stable. And also within this perspective, diaspora and domesticity form not a dichotomy, but a continuum. So I have focused not so much on the displacement or disadvantage as a given de-territorialized extension of an ethnic or linguistic group, but rather I have focused on those kinds of congruences and sometimes conflicts that are open to continuous reinterpretation, reconstruction, and transformation through the productive and creative use of the speaker's entire linguistic repertoire. And I have argued that it is this intersection of both connection and transformation that would lead to the reproduction of diasporic languages and cultures and identities. So I will end my talk now with a call to action. But I'm an applied linguist by training. So I believe that it is morally and ethically imperative that we not, we not merely describe the challenges facing diaspora languages and their speakers, but also advocate for policies and programs that support the preservation of endangered languages and the development of diaspora languages so that even in the face of globalization and digitization, these languages will continue to play a central role in shaping the evolving identity of diaspora communities and they can provide a way for us to see the world that is both deeply grounded and forward-looking. And the languages should be not merely repositories of existing knowledge and practices and histories, but also serve as agents for language and cultural reproduction. So we need to start with classrooms and communities to center multilingualism as a norm and to combat racism and xenophobia so that no one, nobody would have to be, to feel pressured to or forced to give up their language and their cultural identity. So with that note, I thank you. <laughs>